Welcome to the Talberg Foundation podcast series, New Thinking for a New World. Host Alan Stoga welcomes leaders from around the world to explore the issues that are challenging and changing their societies. From climate change to democracy under siege to geopolitics and beyond, we are looking for ideas that can make all our lives better. My guest today is David Andelman, a storied American diplomatic correspondent and author who has reported on most of the conflicts that have shaped our modern era. His most recent book is A Red Line in the Sand, Diplomacy, Strategy, and the History of Wars That Still Might Happen. Welcome, David, and congratulations on the book. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you. You have written a deep analysis of all of the danger spots around the world, particularly from an American perspective. It should be required reading for President Biden and his new security team. And I think we would both celebrate that our incoming administration apparently does actually read books. Well, actually, in fact, that's interesting. One of those members of the security team, and I, I don't like to um, tell tales out of school, but one of them did tell me that he had ordered it from Amazon. And I said, well, if you enjoy it, you should maybe pass it on up on the line to, uh, to your boss. So we'll see. <laughs> well, I would argue if he, if he enjoys it, he should not only pass it along, but he should think about what to do with it. Yeah. And, and that's where I'd like to start. If you were briefing the new president what would you tell them are the two or three most dangerous hotspots? And, and what should he do about them? Where, where should President Biden start? Well, one of the themes of my book is that there are more red lines uh, right now, more lines between countries, between ideologies, between um, peoples and so on, than have ever really existed at any single time in history. And, and that was my mission in, in writing this book, was to explore how these came about where they're likely to be going, and so on. We all know what the major hotspots are. You know, it's uh, China in the South China Sea, and um, Korea, and North Korea, and the, and the atomic bomb. It's Iran, and, and their quest for a nuclear weapon. It's, uh, you know, various uh, issues in Mesopotamia, Iraq, and Syria. All across Africa, there are a host of red lines that um, mostly uh, delineate what... Um, where terrorists have begun to pop up, some of them refugees from the Middle East and so on. And of course, then there are the red lines between East and West, um, Russia and Western Europe and America. And there are red lines within Europe as well. So we've looked at all of these. I think that President Biden's principle, he has, well, he has several principal um, issues he needs to deal with first. And his first day, apparently, we already know he's going to put the U.S. back in the Paris Climate Accord, which is great. He's going to re-enter us in the World Health Organization, which is great. But basically, above all, he has to make sure that uh, our allies understand that we are back in the world, that we want to take down the red lines that uh, the Trump administration years before that have been had established, uh, either in an ill-considered or actually malignant uh, fashion. And we need to be back in the game, as it were, and that we're reliable and that we're constant. And that, that is, and that frankly is one of the key themes in my book, that a red line, if it's going to work effectively, and some have worked very effectively, both sides need to understand uh, what they're all about, uh, how they began, what their purpose is, and are committed to making them work. And that's what Biden is going to have to do, I think. You talk in the book, and you've just mentioned this explosion of red lines with countries challenging each other not to do this or to do that or don't you dare cross. It's, o it's almost like a cartoon of, of the Roadrunner and, and, and Wiley Coyote. But I wonder if that explosion is telling us something about the underlying breakdown of global order, the erosion of the dominance of the United States. How worried are you? that we can't get back to something. Well, we always have to go forward. I mean, that's, um, you know, look at look at sharks. If they don't continue moving forward and they don't, they stop eating, they die. You know, the world will die if it doesn't move forward in some fashion. The goal is to have it move forward in a, in a constructive fashion and without being constrained by any of these lines that have been put up in the past to, for any one of a host of reasons, so that we really need to have a sense of what is going to work in the future in terms of our relations, America's relations with the world, but also the world's relations with each other in any given region? What is the relationship between Iran and Iraq, between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and so on? What is the relationship between um, Israel and, and its neighbors? And it's interesting because if you go back in many of these, er many of these areas, 
I go back some cases a thousand years, two thousand years to find red lines that really existed to exist today that really had their roots in greatly historic uh, issues uh, between all of the, the the peoples of the world of that particular region uh, and and beyond. So it's it's. Um, it's interesting. It's it's not only an, an issue that's grown up recently. Some of these have roots very, very deeply in the past. But we need to understand that and we need to master all of that if we're going to go forward and figure a way of either working with these red lines or dismantling them. You talk in the book a lot about the Middle East and, and in both historical context and in recent history. And then, of course, we have this most recent chapter of the so-called Abraham Accords, um, which may or may not have changed everything. So we go back to an old Sunni Shia fight, but now it is the Persians, the Iranians, the Shia on one side, and the Arabs, and of all people, the Israelis on the other side. So that evolution of who's where, of what red lines matter, of what are the challenges, is a dramatic departure, it seems. How are you thinking about the Abraham Accords? I kind of like them in principle. Uh, I think it's great if um, all of these countries can begin to understand the values that they have of of working together rather than across purposes. And and the certainly the uh, the Israelis understand the value of getting along with their neighbors in some fashion. But there there are certain underpinnings of the Abraham Accords that, that trouble me a little bit. Uh, one of the principal uh, elements of it that um, of them that, that trouble me is this need for. Israel to exercise some degree of restraint in, in, in basically continuing to uh, you know, creep forward into into Palestinian territory and then continue to seize more uh, land and and seize more villages uh, for their own and so on. This was one of the fundamentals of the Abraham Accords, and this was the reason why um, all of these other countries that have signed on to them and and open diplomatic relations and trade and whatever and and especially tourism. By the way, I, I might add that tourism was a very important element of all of these things, uh, purely materialistic. But but the reason that they were able to do that is because because they have this pledge from Israel not to continue to usurp uh, Palestinian lands. Well, that is already seems to be a little bit problematic since we already do have reports of, uh, you know, 80 houses seized there and a you know, village seized there and whatever. And basically, shall we say, creeping um, dissolution, hopefully that doesn't happen, but creeping dissolution of the agreement as uh, the underpinnings of the agreement. So. What I've said from the beginning, since especially since I finished writing the book, and, and especially the, um, the final chapter, which deals specifically with Israel and the Abraham Accords and some of those areas. And in fact, I wrote, I, I ran the full page, a full page map of the Abraham Accords that Kushner, uh, Jared Kushner, uh, drafted and is in that document. I ran that in this book uh, to show exactly what the stakes are. But um, basically, what we have to make sure of is, is that um, Israel understands the stakes involved and are prepared to go along with it. Now, with the Israeli election coming along pretty quickly, I don't know. I mean, Netanyahu has painted himself into a corner. Other people have painted themselves into corners. And, and I'm not sure that they have the forbearance to be able to, you know, understand that they need to simply restrain themselves, at least for a while. Um, because if that doesn't happen, th then it's never going to go any further. And, and by the way, what they also have to find a way. And, and I think if anybody can do this, Biden and Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan, uh, respectively, um, the Secretary of State designate and the National Security Advisor designate, if any of them can get the Palestinians to come in and at least talk, they, they can. But after the U.S. moved the embassy to Jerusalem, um, you know, the Palestinians said that we're out, you know, we don't have anything to do with this. But um, I think that there are ways of getting them to the table also. All of these are necessary if these accords are going to work and if all of these, this web of red lines in that whole region are going to begin to uh, fade away into pink or rose or begin fading away entirely, which I devoutly hope will happen. Let me push you on that only in this regard. I sense a bit of a nod and a wink between the Arabs and the Israelis over the Palestinians, uh, that there are issues now perhaps that are more important to a number of the Arab states. Uh, I wonder if the Palestinians, like the Kurds, whom you talk about in the book as well, like other peoples, the Rohingya, haven't had their place as losers in the great game cemented by this most recent accord. 
maybe I mean the world can see that the you know this, these lands are being taken and seized and whatever. And uh, the more that are, the more that uh, becomes clear that the Israelis are not going to respect that very Im important underpinning of the Abraham Accords. I think the less likely it is that all of these other things will bear any fruit at all. I mean, those things could have, I mean, trade and technology and all of that stuff, they could have been important 10 years ago, five years ago, you know, three years ago. But, um, you know, the, so, and, and to have them actually come bear fruit, they haven't borne fruit yet. I mean, hopefully they will. But uh, I think if the Palestinians are left hanging out to dry in the end, uh, that's going to make it awfully diff a, a very steep hill to climb, I think, uh, frankly. But you will see. I mean, I hope for the best. Let's shift slightly north to uh, Iran. And and again, you, you you write at length about the situation in Iran, the, the evolution of that history over years, good, bad, and ugly. Um, if you were sitting in Tehran today watching the United States cope with its domestic internal issues, uh, segue from a... a one particular kind of administration, whatever adjectives we might use, to one that looks more familiar to listening to both loud and quiet uh, requests to reinvigorate, reimagine, rejoin the um, nuclear deal to, to make that work again. If you were sitting in Tehran, what do you, how do you think you would make your calculus? Well, first of all, um... When, when we say Tehran, it's it's this is not a homogeneous organization by any means. Uh, on its good days, right? On its right, exactly. On its good days, exactly. Um, but but look, you have an entire you have a spectrum at least as fraught and complex as you have in Israel, where there are like twenty apart twenty parties in the Knesset and twenty five others trying to get into the Knesset the parliament. So, but you have equally as many factions in um, in Iran. You have. Uh, on the one on the one extreme, you have some very a lot of very liberal people, including a lot of the bazaaris, you know, the people who run small merchants and whatever, who really are the backbone of the Iranian economy. On on one extent, who want really a greater opening to the West, more markets, more you know, push certainly an end to sanctions and so on, all the way across through the spectrum of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, the militant conservatives, all the way to the the um, more extreme ayatollahs, and again, there are the ayatollah. The ranks of the senior ayatollahs are not, at any rate, at any any degree homogeneous. Although um, among the more conservative, unfortunately, is the supreme leader um, uh, Ali Khamenei. So um, the, the question then is: uh, so who is in charge, and who's calling the shots in Iran? I don't think anybody really knows that. But I think right now, unless and, and Biden is going to have a, it's going to be tough. And and frankly. I wrote this in a, in a commentary that should be publishing maybe even by the time this is uh, out on the air um, for CNN, saying that uh, basically um, Biden is going to have to figure a way of threading his way between all the different factions there and, and helping understand he cannot lift the sanctions immediately. He's not going to lift them immediately. On the other hand, the Iranians have to make sure that they're making some kind of concessions. And frankly, I think to a degree they are. We got past the actual um, the, a critical anniversary just uh, last week when a year ago, uh, President Trump ordered the execution, the assassination of uh, General uh, Qasem Soleimani, Soleimani, the um, the head of the um, uh, uh, some port, uh, an important portion of the Revolutionary Guard forces, um, and and he was really a hero. He was a martyr in many respects, but a hero, and to so many people across all the spectrum in the in, in Iran, when Trump ordered that execution, that was just horrible. I mean, that was a huge event. If the Iranians hadn't screwed it up by accidentally shooting down a passenger plane, which was completed, you see, but um, they, they would have been in a good position to have retaliated dramatically against us. As it is, a year from now, everybody was expecting this is when they're going to really retaliate. And they didn't. So the question now is, if I was sitting in Iran, am I saying to myself, hmm, maybe they actually are waiting to see if we can do some kind of a deal with the West, you know, we come back into this treaty. So on the one hand, we've said we are going to increase our uranium stockpile to 20 percent concentration, which is another step towards a bomb. But on the other hand, we haven't expelled the all of the um, nuclear inspectors yet. And we haven't um, attacked American or Western forces in, in Iraq or any place uh, because of Soleimani. So I would say that there's a chance that this could work, that returning to this 
in some fashion to this uh, treaty or renegotiating this treaty could work. And I hope it can. It would certainly uh, take away one of the greater risks war in the Middle East, or at least that kind of confrontation in the Middle East. But maybe the reddest of red lines going forward, or the one that needs the most tension, is the relationship between the United States and China. You alluded earlier to the South China Sea, uh, where the Chinese have aggressively been uh, filling in, literally filling in the red line uh, with sand and gravel and islands. Uh, we've had no end of bumps, not just during the last four years, during the last eight, 12 years, um, as the two great powers, one legacy, one emerging, seem to try to figure out how, what kind of world they want, how they want to relate to each other. Impossible question, but I'll ask it anyhow. What would you anticipate the next chapters of that relationship might look like? Well, I, I think, first of all, I think we have a couple of people at the top, um, like uh, Blinken and his deputy, Wendy Sherman, and, and Jake Sullivan in, in the White House on the NSC. Um, I think that um, they really understand what China really wants. What China really wants is to be accepted and acknowledged as a great power. And it, it's that simple. Um, they want the respect that they believe they are entitled to as the potentially the second most, uh, the largest economy in the world. In fact, it looks like um, for a whole host of reasons, the only econ major economy in the world in, the la in 2020 that um, uh, will actually have been expanding rather than contracting. The numbers we saw the other day were over 2% expansion. Everybody else is going to be contracting. But um, they want to be they want to be respected. And, um, and and that's not that hard to do. I mean, we should respect them. And, and this is something that I don't think they ever really got from the United States under Trump. I mean, Trump could say, oh, she and I got along great and whatever, we played golf or we, what, I took him to a golf course. If he didn't play golf, he played golf, I guess, with the Japanese uh, uh, prime minister. But um, but at, at least, um, you know, understand that, that there is a person at the top or people at the top who understand what they want, what they need. And, and um, you know, there's got to be some kind of a condominium. But I have to say that with the corollary to that is, of course, that this means that China will continue to build its military forces dramatically. And this is something I explore in great detail in this book. I think China wants and expects it can get very quickly a blue water navy, which it has never had before. It is already establishing a series of military bases. They call it the String of Pearls around the Indian Ocean uh, over towards the Middle East and Africa. Um, military bases uh, along that periphery, uh, which will expand their, their front yard, if you will, from just the South China Sea, which they have now basically secured almost entirely um, to other parts of the world. And eventually they're building and they're building aircraft carriers. But also, and this is interesting because I had a long conversation last week with Michel Flournoy, who was the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense under um, um, under Obama. And she says to me, um, you know, not only are they building their own Navy, but they're developing missile systems that can take out a lot of oil forces, our aircraft carriers, in the first, you know, 30 minutes of, of any war. But both she and I agree that China doesn't want a war. That's the last thing they want. Uh, they want to be prosperous. They want to rule the world economically and in all those fashions. So they want a recognition that they have the right to compete in that fashion, in some fashion, and in, in some way um, become a major power and perceived as a major power in every respect. I had the opportunity six years ago to listen to a very senior Chinese official lecture, a very senior American official on the Monroe Doctrine. And his point was just, he said, as you declared and enforced the Monroe Doctrine to push the Europeans out of the Americas, uh, we think that our Caribbean is the South and East China Seas, and that under the flag of Asia for the Asians, uh, we intend to dominate that space. What is, what is the United States going to be able to do in Asia? What do the Chinese want to do in other parts of the world? How do we get to that shared recognition between the Chinese and the Americans, what those lines might be, of who gets to draw the lines and where the biggest, the most important risks might be? Well, we did have a lot of friends in Asia, and in fact, um, we still do, I think. Uh, you know, all of the periphery of the South China Sea, uh, all of uh, the ASEAN countries, Southeast Asian countries, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Philippines, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, Malaysia, uh, that whole uh, Singapore, Indonesia, that whole periphery used to be um, really 
our our kind of people, our people. And in fact, uh, when we were negotiating a uh, a, uh, a trade pact that would have included all of them, uh, that would have been a very good way of isolating China or neutralizing it in many respects. But now, uh, Trump, the first thing he did is he came in and he blew up that whole um, Asian um, accord that would have uh, been a wonderful trade uh, agreement that uh, was really would have been a landmark agreement and would have cemented those countries' uh, loyalty to us at the same time uh, deprive China of, uh, you know, a lot of the, the trade and, and economic advantages of, of the kind of agreement that they finally did conclude when we pulled out. And so they may be trying to steal these people's islands, uh, islands that are claimed by Vietnam and, and the Philippines and Malaysia and, and so on. But they're also, at the same time, uh, helping these countries as well and trading with them and, and, allowing them to, and, and allowing them to establish and open factories that will trade with China and so forth. So this is something that um, we need to get over. We need to get back to the position of some kind of a leadership role in that part of the world and an understanding of, of just how important that is to us and to them. Let me segue out of the physical world into the cyber world. When people think of red lines, as your book title, they think of lines in the sand and, and there's all of the historic lines that were really drawn in the sand at various points. Uh, but cyber changes everything. How do we think about red lines in cyberspace? It, the same way as in, in the physical world or is there something different? Is there a different approach needed? Oh, no, I think in many respects, it's exactly the same approach. Um, you know, there was only one real violation. I mean, a, a, apart from the our elections and all that sort of thing, what Russia has been doing, there has really been only one major cyber attack in the classic uh, wartime sense. And, and that was um, a few years ago in uh, Estonia, uh, when Russia staged a, a really an outright full scale cyber attack on Estonia. And it really did take down the entire economy and society of that country for about a week until they were finally able to neutralize and defeat it. And um, and, and uh, the Russians pulled back for a whole host of reasons. And, and Estonia is a NATO country. So it is a NATO. It could have become a NATO issue as well. The NATO Article 5 of the NATO Treaty says... Um, you know, an attack on one is an attack on all. And in theory, all of NATO could have retaliated on Russia, but it didn't happen that way. And Estonian uh, prime minister told me around shortly after that time was because nobody actually died in that war, but people could have. And uh, that would be the criterion, I think, in the future. So cyber warfare is every bit as important. It's just another tool in the warfare toolbox, if you will. Um, but the underlying red lines that either um, it supports or it defends or it establishes really haven't changed that much um, in that respect. Uh, diplomacy is still important. Uh, war fighting capability is important. Strategy is desperately important. So uh, we need to pay attention to all of this. We need to have really develop our cyber capabilities. Article 5 wasn't, wasn't invoked because no one died. Of course, by the time somebody dies in, in the cyber world, the war is probably over as part of the problem, don't you think? Well, it is, or or it's just going to the next stage. I don't know. I mean, uh, look, uh, it's never happened, so no one can really say exactly what's going, how it could happen. I'm sure there are people at Rand Corporation or someone who are doing war games on on precisely the subject just as we speak. But um, um, sure, uh, it's it's look, the the Russians have tremendous capability. So do we, and we've demonstrated that in the past. Maybe they need a good demonstration. The Iranians were demonstrated that when we basically took down um, a, a lot of their um, enrichment uh, operations by a cyber attack. So, you know, we do have that capability. The Chinese have that capability. Um, a lot of the NATO countries have that capability. The Russians certainly do. Um, probably the North Koreans have that as well. So, sure, it's another form of warfare that is insidious and um, into which red lines have, I mean, are, are already drawn in, in, in many respects and, and which are used in many ways to, to build on and reinforce the existing red lines that would be ordinarily defended maybe by nuclear means or, or some other uh, deterrent uh, situations. Final question. Clearly, and you've said it several different ways, the last four years of uh, the presidency of Donald Trump has not improved the position of the United States in the world, quite the opposite. But quite frequently at the start of an administration, and we've seen this through history a number of times, our opponents like to try to take our medal, take our measure uh, by challenging the United States here or there or somewhere else. 
Um, and we, we've seen, we saw it when President Kennedy was in office. Uh, we've seen it, uh, we saw it when Nixon was in office uh, and, and so on, coming into office. Do you think we have the conditions under which we should expect such a challenge? And if so, where, impossible question again, where would it come from, do you think? Oh, I think it could come from everywhere. I think that absolutely will. I think it could come from anywhere. I think it's already started in many respects. I think when um, the, the Russians seized uh, Alexei Navalny, uh, Putin's opponent, when he came back uh, on Sunday, from uh, Sunday the um, uh, the seventeenth, from uh, January seventeenth, from from Bonn, uh, from Berlin to uh, to Moscow, they seized him at the airport. That was a direct, uh, clear signal to the United States and the West. Um, we don't care. We're going to do anything we feel like doing if it's important to us. Um, you know, and, and immediately some of the Biden people were outraged by this, and they should be. So if Russia is going to be willing to come back to the, going to, if we're going to be able to get back to the table with Russia, they've got to understand that it's in their ball is in their court now to play ball with us and to at least give us something back. And I think all of these countries need to understand it's time that they understand that a red line uh, cuts two ways. And we can establish them and we can enforce them just as well as they can. And we will watch how they respect our lines that are important to us. And they should watch that because if they want to have any kind of a decent relationship with us, and it will be worth it in the long run, especially as long as Biden and, and his um, or his successors are in charge, then I think that they really need to understand that they need to go at least halfway, if not more than halfway, to meet our needs as we will try to meet theirs. But certainly the Navani case, uh, the Hong Kong case, uh, the signing of the European Union, China investment accord, despite a public plea from uh, the incoming administration to delay it until they had a chance to begin a conversation. You have the sense that maybe people don't want better relationships with the United States or feel that we are so weakened uh, that they can push on those red lines, constrain us a little bit more, and, and better to do it right from the start. No, I think that the greatest fear, and I've talked to a lot of European diplomats, especially in very high-level French diplomats in the last uh, 10 days, two weeks, is they're concerned that, in fact, uh, Biden and company are simply an interregnum uh, and not a return to normalcy. That, in fact, the real tendency of the United States has been expressed by Trump and his colleagues, his uh, friends, rather than um, what Biden is bringing back to the table. That Biden issue is only, that Biden is only simply a very brief respite, and then we're back to where we really had intended to be. We have to show the Europeans, and it may take four years, it may take, hopefully it'll only take a couple of years or maybe less, but if we can assure them that the United States is not simply taken leveled out in a long downward spiral, but has in fact reversed that spiral and is trying to spiral back up towards the surface. That is the only way we are ever going to become a major power again in, in the world, I think. And that is the fundamental challenge facing this government and indeed all of us uh, who want to see the United States play a significant global role. Thank you very much for that. And again, I want to thank you. I enjoyed reading uh, the book, Red Lines, A Red Line in the Sand, Diplomacy, Strategy, and the History of Wars that still might happen. Let's hope those wars that still might happen don't happen anytime soon. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments on our website, talbergfoundation.org, and please subscribe to the podcast in the app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.